Hi guys, it's Jessica. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to give final impressions on season one of Shadow and Bone. For any who don't know, I gave my first impressions of episodes one through four earlier on the channel about two weeks ago now. And if you're looking for those first impressions, you can go ahead and find the video here in the iCard above. Today I want to talk about what I thought about the conclusion of the series and I'm doing a little bit unusual. I have kind of like a mental script going on and a couple of notes I took while watching the show but I didn't outline it all out a hundred percent. I've been doing these more casual conversations on the nevers which I have a playlist for here and it's been a lot of fun and I really am enjoying some of the extra energy and impromptu information that's going in there and I thought the best way to recreate that possibly for these last three episodes in Shadow and Bone is just to do a more off-the-cuff kind of video. I'm just gonna give a couple general thoughts and impressions for the overall Shadow and Bone. First of all I want to say on a technical level this is great. The episodes continue to be excellent. I love the costuming. I love the lighting that's used. I love the set pieces. I'm not an expert on those things obviously as you can probably tell from my own limited camera setup. As far as what I can discern and pick up, everything there looks really good and looks a lot better than many other shows I'm watching, including The Nevers. Shadow and Bone, the visual here, the only thing I can think of that matches it is The Handmaid's Tale, and both of those are pretty big money productions. I even think that in a lot of ways, Shadow and Bone does better than Lord of the Rings, and I know Lord of the Rings was what? 20 years ago now, a long time, but it's been the gold standard for fantasy movies and TV shows to me for a while. Even though I'm not a big fan of those books, I love those movies, they're also very immersive and grand and sweeping. So it's great that I have something new that's like that. When I saw episode five, I thought, man, my first impression should have included one to five. It wouldn't have given me a lot here in the back half to talk about, but I feel like episode five is a major turning point for the story of Alina and the Darkling. Alina finally learns that the general guy there is the Darkling, which is something I knew both because I was vaguely aware of the plot of Shadow and Bones and because it's pretty obvious in his dress and his intensity and the whole way his character is played that he's gonna be the major villain of this show. So for me, like it was nice to get there. Like finally, Alina is on the same page as me. I really needed her to get there. I'm so glad we're at that point. Alina's character has been incredibly frustrating. I guess it's partially because she is the young adult female protagonist. She's supposed to be young, naive, not well informed, ignorant, all these other things. But it's hard to be too ignorant or too trusting when you have been a country at war and you've been a cartographer within the army for this long. So I found it supremely frustrating that this young woman was so trusting of all the people in the little palace. She'd spent all this time not trusting Grisha while she was in the army, being suspicious of them, and suddenly she just drops that. The Grisha aren't even that nice to her. A lot of them are still showing both over and casual racism to her. And they're being mean and jealous and petty with her for other reasons as well, including her upbringing, including the fact that they didn't find her sooner. Just like a lot of things that were outside Alina's control or that don't make sense for those Grisha to make fun of her for. I mean, they need Alina and they should want her to be happy to be there, they should want her to like them, and they're acting against their own self-interest. They hate her for some random reason so much. Which might be some interesting points about racism or some interesting points about humanity as a whole, but it should also make Alina kind of wary of these characters, a little bit less trusting. Not to mention the whole way that the Grisha's power is trained out of them is through pain and sort of like personal torment or suffering. That would make me resent the people that did that to me. It would make me angry at the world. It would make me like the power even less. It would make me question the whole system. 
So to see Alina just kind of like going along with it, like everybody does this and there's no better way. And it's totally cool that I'm being hurt or tortured for a higher power. All of that rubs me the wrong way and makes me feel that Alina is too naive and actually she tips over into stupid when she believes that Mal is not writing letters to her or that her letters are being received by Mal and he's not responding to them. What about her entire life's existence with Mal made her think that her letters were being received by Mal and he wasn't responding to them. When has he ever ignored her or blown her off? But she just trusts that all of this is the truth and from there she decides to get romantically involved with the Darkling, which I find very frustrating. And then she argues with Bagra for a little bit, but seems to like accept that that dude is a Darkling right away. Which is also kind of confusing to me, because like, if you've decided to initiate a romantic relationship with a guy, if you think the two of you are like kindred spirits or whatever, commit to it. Like, either commit to Mel, who is your childhood friend, and had deserved way more loyalty and benefit of the doubt than you gave him, or commit to the Darkling. You guys have been through a lot together these past couple of months, I guess. I don't know. I, number one, I don't know how long it's been. Like, I guess if it's been a year or two years together and you guys have been continuing to bond and form a relationship, maybe that's more understandable. From watching the show, it felt like you guys had spent a, me a month together and she just decided that Mal had given up on her and she was gonna go after the Darkling now. But the same way, she just kind of like accepted everything that the Grisha told her and did to her and was like, and I'm here now and I'm perky and happy to be here. When Bagger comes, she has like a minute where she's like, no, that's not true. And then right after that, she's like, it is true. Everything he said is true. The dark going is evil. Even though I was falling in love with him before, now I know he is the worst. To keep that kind of trust and immediate acceptance, it feels convenient to the story. But even if we were giving her the benefit of the doubt and saying like, well, the story was written when she was a 16 year old character. So some of this trusting is related to her age and her lack of experience. You would think by the time Bagger gets there, some of that would be wearing off. She would have had to become a little bit more savvy, a little more crafty just to survive the palace. But also because she's had so many like twisty upsets in her life at this point in time. You can't just be trusting what everyone says to you all the time, especially if the information is conflicting. It was good for the story that she went with it, but like it wasn't great as a character. So I really don't like Alina. I find her really frustrating. Part of that is because she's supposed to be the blank slate that we as the audience are projecting ourselves onto. And I don't like to pretend to be someone who is stupid or naive. What's interesting to me about this is the same way that I hate Alina, my husband hates Mal and he hates him for very similar reasons. I was fascinated by this because you know Mal is the male love interest for Alina and I think he might be the male audience insert. This series of books was for young adults and I think it was targeted more for women than for men just because it was a strong female protagonist and pretty much any time a female is the lead the book is for women because men apparently can't relate when there's a female lead. It's odd, but that is like the marketing technique. So these books are meant quote unquote for women. When you adapt it into a show, you want to make it a show that both men and women will enjoy. So they probably took the male love interest and said this is the male audience insert here. Jonathan just found him to be equally stupid. In Mal's case, I give him a lot of the benefit of the doubt because he has been intentionally kept ignorant. He's just like a rando soldier on the front line and he's appropriately wary and suspicious of people, he remains loyal. He doesn't have this wishy-washy quality that Lena has. And people around him, like his other soldiers, are showing him trust and camaraderie. So even if Mal had some of that too much trust that Alina has, he always seems to think that there's an issue about Alina getting his letters. I don't know if that's something that he's like telling himself or if he really thinks or recognizes that the mail system could have broken down and that's why he's not receiving the letters from 
her and he needs to get to her in person. He doesn't need to give up on her, he just needs to get to her in person. Forgive a lot of what's going on with Mal's character, but Jonathan just hates him. He thinks that that guy is really stupid, he's like a blockhead and just throws himself at stuff, which I guess I could see too. I find it like a little bit romantic because I like the Alina Mal love story, but if you're not into that love story or if you're just talking about like what a character should do when in that situation, Mal should have learned a little bit of savvy. He shouldn't just keep throwing himself in front of bullets and attacking without a plan. I thought the way the story closed on the Six of Crows was a little bit... Mm not fulfilling. I really wanted like a larger heist. I feel like they should have stolen something else or stolen something besides the blueprints successfully. I love the blueprint heist that happens earlier in the season, but it's like not enough success or enough skill on display for me. I'm starting to see the Kaz and the Nej love story. I still don't really like Kaz. I still think he's a little too selfish. He doesn't express himself well. And I feel like Inej gives him a lot of opportunity to. Like, she'll even be like, this is where you say something, anything to me. And he just doesn't pick up on those clues or he doesn't care. It's hard to know. And he's very broody. And I just don't know what his stakes are. I guess he's losing his bar. I don't really even understand why they're going to their country of origin or their city of origin at this point in time. They don't have Alina. They don't seem to have a lot of connections there. I would take what they have and start over someplace else if I were them. But I mean, there's got to be a lot going on in the books that we're just not seeing on screen when it comes to the Six of Crows. I was really perplexed when Mal and Alina didn't team up with them. So far we've only seen three crows and I've been waiting and waiting for the other crows to join. Maybe this one heart renderer who's been going through this side quest is going to join them now. You know, in episodes one through four, I was hoping the heart renderer's story was going someplace because it was taking an awful lot of time. And at this point in time, I kind of wish we just didn't have it. I don't think I like her character. I think her character is just too generic. The whole like we're not witches and Grisha are people too story I guess is fine but it's just like been done a lot and I'm not loving this replay of it. I still don't understand why the Grisha don't run everything in the kingdom. Like we got a backstory on the Darkling and how he created the fold and I still don't understand. He worked for the king and got the king on the throne and then the king came after him because he was too dangerous to leave out in the wild. Instead of fleeing, why didn't the Darkling just kill the king and be like, I'm king now, deuces. Like, I don't understand why the Grisha haven't had a ruling place or a homeland that's just theirs. It's really weird that his response was like to create the fold and then go work for the king. Like the whole reason he created the fold is because he didn't want to be captured, but then he decided he would go and be in servitude to the king. I really don't understand the Darkling's motivations. It feels like he does stuff for the plot uh, more than anything else. And it's too bad because he's a lot of fun to watch. I love the end of episode eight when he comes out of the fold with the monsters. That's going to be so much fun. But if he could have done that, why hadn't he done it before? <laughs> I don't think his like, I lost a girlfriend slash fiance is a good reason for him to go all crazy serial killer. I don't know what it is about people where they think like, if you're very powerful and you fall in love with someone, you're gonna go evil the second that person gets killed. This is something that we just got in Justice League again. Superman in that story happens to be just on the edge of turning into a sociopath if Lois Lane is ever murdered in Zack Snyder's Justice League. And now we're here with the Darkling and it's like exactly the same theme. It's not even that interesting. And I think it takes a lot of autonomy away from these men. With any characters in this situation though, they have, they're more than just the relationship. Yes, those relationships might be grounding to them. Those relationships might mean a lot to them and they might grieve in different ways than someone less powerful would. Perhaps they put laws in place or perhaps they take over kingdom. I don't they just go around doing horrible genocides and stuff because the person they loved is dead. Especially if they really loved that person, really understood them, and that person didn't want that. 
why would you do that? Like, we don't know almost anything about this heart renderer, but it seems to me that she wanted the Grisha to be safe and free. I don't see how creating the fold achieves those goals. If the Darkling had gone and killed the king, sure, I can see how killing the king and taking over might have led to him creating a safe space for the Grisha. His argument where he's like, I created the little palace. I want all Grisha to be safe. Was this really the only way you could do that? You can't be this old and this patient and have this many step ahead plans and not see that this was an incredibly convoluted way to achieve that goal. <laughs> Sorry, not sorry. I don't think the plot was anything special. I really enjoy Inej and Jasper over on the Six of Crows side. I feel like the story for the Six of Crows petered out so a little bit I didn't get to continue enjoying them the way I wanted to. I love where the story is going next season where we're gonna fight those monsters from the fold, but like nothing about it was surprising or wowing. It's not worth a rewatch in my opinion. Like this isn't something I'd ever watch again or would need to revisit to get ready for the next season uh, and I just prefer like a slightly more complicated story. I feel like there were a lot of elements in this that we accept because this is how the story is usually told and we're used to this kind of story but it's not like a story that we might prefer or even a story that is at its pinnacle. And I think too Shadow and Bones has a lot of following. A lot of people who read this as teens are now in their early 20s and they're the people that this is marketed to and they're having like that nostalgia moment as well and I'm glad they're having it. Certainly when the first movie of The Hunger Games came out I had a similar moment where I was just enjoying the nostalgia and the ambiance of the moment like yes this is what I wanted for my book. So I understand the discussions going on there but I don't think there's like a lot of deep themes or even remarkable plot points going on. Certainly the story is solid. Lee Bardugo is a great storyteller and I look forward to more future work and entries from her. But you can tell a story well without it being necessarily anything groundbreaking. And I really think that's what Shadow and Bone is doing. And I think it's elevating the expectations for fantasy and it's helping create space for more experimental or newer stories going forward. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw like a whole rash of new fantasy TV shows and fantasy movies come out of this, especially because Shadow and Bone has been so well received. And I'm hoping that in the fall, when the Dune movie comes out, we're also going to see this kind of enthusiasm and pick up for science fiction. So overall, I think Shadow and Bone is great for the genre and is a fun watch through like once, especially with friends or with other people. I think it has a couple of elements that are worth discussing with them and getting other people's takes on. If you like this, feel free to click the like button. And if you're looking for more Lee Bardugo specific content, as I said before, I do have a first impressions for Shadow and Bone one through four, but I also have a work shopped it on Ninth House, which is her debut new adult urban fantasy. And I love Ninth House. I would definitely recommend that. It also shows that Lee Bardugo has a lot of great body horror and general darker elements that she can write to. We see a little bit of it here at the end of Shadow and Bone, but it goes way grimmer if you're looking for something like that in Ninth House. And I have a playlist of my reviews and recommendations up here. Those reviews and recommendations are going to include TV shows, movies, and books from a fantasy science fiction genre. The books in specific are mostly from Kindle Unlimited, so if you're using that service and wondering like, hey, what could I be reading? Or hey, what's good in the fantasy science fiction genre? You should definitely check out those recommendations, or you can just check out my Kindle Unlimited playlist. If you like the fantasy science fiction, deep dives and evaluations, reviews, just random thought streams, feel free to subscribe to the channel. I do weekly videos that come out on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Central Time, and I do a more casual, usually shorter video on Sundays at 1 p.m. We just wrapped up the Nevers over there, and we're gonna be starting a new TV show. I think it's gonna be Amazon Prime Solos this coming Sunday. Other than that, thank you for coming to the end of the video. Thank you for your support, and I hope you guys are having a great day. Bye!